You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Smogley Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, host of World Class and director of the Freeman Smogley Institute. Over the past several weeks, protests have erupted in cities around the United States and the world following the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Given the current political climate in the United States, I wanted to invite back a familiar face to join a face. I don't know if his face is familiar, but his voice is familiar. And today his face will be familiar here on World Class to discuss systematic racism, police brutality, and the future of American democracy. I'm pleased to welcome back Larry Diamond. He is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute, affiliated with the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's the author of dozens of books, more books than anybody I know, uh, by the way, on democracy, including most recently, Ill Wins, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency. Welcome back to the podcast, Larry. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Mike. Well, let's start with the big hard question right away. Since the killing of George Floyd, the U.S. has seen widespread protests. Some are comparing it to something we haven't seen since the late 1960s. Some people think that the American democracy is falling apart. Help us understand, what is your assessment, Larry? Well, I think American democracy is facing its most uh, serious challenge in many decades, uh, at least since the late 1960s and uh, maybe deeper than that, but because we have this new challenge of justifiable and necessary outrage over institutionalized racism and police brutality in the United States intersecting with the crisis of public health that we are facing in the U.S. Right. as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, intersecting with the economic depression that is falling upon the United States with the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression, uh, and intersecting with uh, a presidency that has abused power and checks and balances to a greater extent, certainly than any in modern American history. So we've got multiple crises and challenges uh, intersecting and intertwining with one another. Um, I think, however, <clears throat> there are some positive and hopeful aspects to this. And the, the fact of the protests, the scope of the protests, the intensity of the protests and the outrage uh, that they have unleashed is not only a sign of great and intolerable deficiency in American democracy, but also a sign of the vitality of American democracy. And indeed, Same. African-American uh, civil rights leaders, including the Reverend Al Sharpton in both of his uh, moving eulogies uh, in memory of George Floyd in Minneapolis and Houston, have taken heartening note of how multiracial the protests have been uh, in terms of, to a much greater extent than the civil rights movement, Though, let's not forget that Freedom Summer and the struggle for the vote in the American South did mobilize um, idealistic young white people to stand in solidarity with African Americans uh, in the civil rights movement in the American South and even risking their lives. But to a much greater extent now, as African American civil rights leaders have noted, you have white Americans, Asian Americans, uh, uh, Latino and Latina Americans and, you know, virtually every kind of American, young and old, in these protests. And also, Mike, there was a very interesting uh, column uh, today, so we're talking June 10th in the Washington Post, by Erica uh, Chenoweth uh, of Harvard Kennedy School and two of her colleagues. Yes, and we know her well. Friends. She's done some fantastic work on Nonviolent civic resistance. Was it about that? 
Well, it was about nonviolent protest in the United States in response to the killing of George Floyd uh -huh. and the whole trail of uh, police killings and what we've seen. And what they note is that, uh, of course, Erica is a specialist on protest that the scope of the protests right. is greater than anything that we have data for in modern American history. Right. That is that we're seeing protests in many dozens of small towns and small cities uh, in uh, every single state of the United States. Uh, and this is something we did not see across the country in the civil rights movement, or even I was deeply involved in it in the anti-war movement. So this is a sign of, I'd say, a new vibrancy and um, resolve in American democracy that I think can give us hope. But you know the old saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Yes. And we can't waste the opportunity to bring about lasting and real change in the issues that have mobilized people to protest. Well, let's talk about that in a minute. I would just note, I'm from Montana, as you know, Larry, and there were 3,000 people demonstrating in my oh. hometown of Bozeman, Montana, and a very small town up in the north where my mom's from, Haver, Montana. I think the population's there, maybe two or 3,000. They even had protests there. So you're right. It was... Uh, uh, and I did see Erica's piece. It's it, quite striking how uh, across the country it's been, and maybe historic in that way. But let's talk about what you just said, it, to go from protest to change. Uh, obviously, the killing of George Floyd has shown a spotlight on what seems to be a growing problem of pol police brutality and violence, especially against Black Americans. Do you have a problem, do we, not you, do we have a problem of systemic racism in American policing in specific? And if so, what are some ideas for how it can be fixed? Well, uh, I want to say, first of all, that when two white males are having this conversation, we need to bring a lot of humility to the conversation. Um, cool. And I know, Mike, you are very deeply committed to uh, ensuring that FSI is going to have uh, a more diverse face than it's had in discussing these issues. And we all need to do better uh, about that. But coming to police reform, uh, I'm not an expert on policing. I'm not an expert on, on some of the issues we're talking about. But I think every every American citizen and certainly every uh, person who fancies themselves uh, some kind of scholar of democracy, including American democracy, had better become familiar yes. uh, with some of the issues and challenges in terms of policing. Because the one thing we do know, I know this from post-conflict uh, democratic reconstruction, uh, we know it from some of our comparative work, Mike, that the police are the face of the state right. that the ordinary citizen most frequently experiences. Right. And so if you have a problem with fairness, transparency, and justice, or corruption, or abuse in policing, you have a problem in state society relations, and you have a problem in democracy and potentially democratic legitimacy. So we can't treat this as some kind of isolated issue in a box somewhere that right. um, you know, is something that only experts on policing need to worry about. It's and um, I've benefited a lot uh, in the last uh, week or two from some of the work um, of uh, Sherilyn Eiffel, who's yes. president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, Kristen Clark, uh, the president and executive di the director of the Lawyers uh, Committee for Civil Rights, uh, the work of the task force on uh, 21st century policing that President Obama appointed in 2015. And, you know, if you mash uh, together, a lot of what these people are writing, and now the bill that the House of Representatives 
uh, is pushing forward on policing reform led by the Congressional Black Caucus, you get to an agenda that I think um, uh, the country needs to rally around. And just some of the bullet points that I would stress are, uh, it, we can't just do this one, one community uh, by community. We need a national level strategy and national level standards for police reform. Right. Uh, and uh, I say this both because some things like banning chokeholds, for exa example, uh, should be uh, simply national rules and laws, but also because I think we're learning now very quickly that one of the obstacles to reform, one of the most formidable, is the power of police unions in each of these communities. Right. And unless we have a national level strategy, it's going to really be hard to overcome the local level power of police unions uh, and their resistance to reform. And I might say it's a general problem with public sector unions. And some people feel that, you know, the teachers union uh, unions have been uh, a bit of an obstacle to more accountability for quality teaching. I think some of the other bullet points are that um, we need to have a more engaged Department of Justice to uh, enforce uh, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, that bans uh, systematic racial discrimination and that should therefore deprive local police departments of federal funding if they have right. a record of this. Uh -huh. We need national standards for training in local police. Everybody's talking about community policing, Mike. So, you know, we need to get back to a uh, change in the culture and mindset that emphasizes less use of force and more engagement with the community, which means that we need to demilitarize the police and not be just reflexively transferring surplus military equipment right. uh, at low cost to uh, police departments. A uh, few more bullet points. Uh, we need to revise the principle of what's called qualified immunity that enables uh, police to, frankly, claim that what they did was what any reasonable cop would have done in similar circumstances. And if that involves excessive use of force and deprivation of someone's civil rights, including the right to life, that excuse isn't good enough any longer. We need special prosecutors to get involved in prosecuting uh, police abuse so that local district attorneys who work closely with the police don't and you know are compromised in what they what they can do and still be able to work with the police in the future, don't have to bear that burden. Right. As uh, Eiffel and others have emphasized, we need a national database of officers who've been terminated for misconduct in this regard and decertifying them so that they don't take a job in the police force in another community. Uh, we need more transparency about the records of these police officers who've had complaints against them. And again, never again should a police officer be able to use any kind of chokehold or pressure on the neck like that awful eight eight minute and 46 second tape we saw that uh, ended the life of George Floyd. Those are just some of the things that people are talking about that I, I think the country could rally around. Those are very useful, very concrete. And we will circulate with our podcast links to all those documents and authors that you just mentioned, Larry. Uh, I wanna pivot briefly to another, um, you, you mentioned the triple transition, triple crises we're in, right, of the pandemic. Uh, what's happened around the killing of George Floyd, but also about voting. Uh, you just wrote a very interesting piece in the American Interest, I think just out today, focused on voter suppression and the need to fully restore the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I, I think you wrote it in the wake of what happened in Georgia. Can you just explain to our listeners what's your argument there and why it's so important? Well, um, I just wanna say uh, that aside from the police 
killing African Americans uh, without justification through the excessive use of force. And now we're learning that uh, this police officer, uh, Chauvin, might have actually had a grudge against George Floyd. He knew him personally. But aside from that, there are a few things that make me angrier in American democracy than deliberate efforts, which I think are escalating in scale to prevent African Americans and other, nat uh, 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 other uh, uh, minority groups, including Native Americans, for example, in North right. Dakota, right. Uh, from being able to vote. It, it's just, as, as I said in my piece, people bled and died in the civil rights movement for this most precious of, and, and foundational of all other democratic rights. And now you've got cynical local authorities from one particular party, uh, if we can just talk frankly, who think that uh, the only way they can hold on to power in their state is to suppress the right of people of color to vote. And it's just unacceptable. The 1965 Voting Rights Act had a crucial provision that required that certain states with a history of racial discrimination in voting had to get pre-clearance before they could make changes in their rules. Right. Like the changes that are knocking people off the voter register or changing the rules for who can vote and how. And in 2013, the Supreme Court struck that down and said it was no longer necessary and it was uh, an overreach and so on and so forth. And predictively, we've had a new wave of, um, uh, of voter suppression and violation of the civil rights to vote of racial minorities around the country. So a House bill that was passed uh, in November of last year would restore the pre-clearance provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And of course, okay. it's tied up in the Senate now. Mitch McConnell is not allowing it to be considered, but uh, we need to fully restore and fully enforce the Voting Rights Act and not uh, allow uh, the right to vote to be violated on the flimsy grounds that we're trying to save money or we're trying to uh, prevent voter fraud that you know no one has been able to document uh, as having existed under these circumstances. And we saw, Mike, yesterday, Tuesday, June 9th, in the state of Georgia, what we're facing in terms of intolerably long lines in now dangerous circumstances under COVID-19, uh, threatening the ability of people to vote if we don't get this right. Well, that leads me maybe to my last question. Maybe one more about us locally um, will be my last question. But Larry, you've studied the breakdown of democracies in other countries. How worried are you about November? If we see a repeat, uh, something that looks like what happened in Georgia across the country for arguably one of the most important votes that Americans can make, a vote for the pre who will be the next president. Uh, Mike, I'm very worried uh, because we have three circumstances that are converging again. A um, rising tide of racially motivated suppression of the right to vote. A uh, pandemic that is making it more difficult for people to vote, even in the absence of any mischief or ill intent and a presidency and a justice department under the current attorney general who at best seem insensitive to any concern about this and at worst are deeply and enthusiastically complicit in it. And that is a very, very dangerous uh, combination, which is why I keep repeating that the work of our colleague, uh, Nate Persley, in his Healthy Election Project uh, and his colleagues uh, at MIT, uh, Charles Stewart, uh, and the great team they've assembled in terms of research and, and advocacy, and the work of others around the country is so important. Uh, it's not so much that this will happen you know, in all 50 states, 
It's that right. if it happens in swing states, right, uh, where there's a close election, uh, it could um, uh, it could produce what is widely perceived to be an illegitimate election, and uh, this time. Uh, on either side, I think we're seeing growing evidence, including from a public opinion survey that I've been involved with, uh, with uh, Democracy Fund, the voter study group in Washington, D.C., that if people believe there has been fraud, illegitimacy, or unfairness in the 2020 election, uh, there's a significantly greater uh, risk of a violent reaction uh, on the streets than what we saw in uh, 2016, when people simply threw up their hands right. uh, in an atmosphere of cynicism and despair. This time there's going to be anger, I think, and um, we just can't let that uh, danger of a fundamental shock to the legitimacy of our democracy happen when we have the means now to avert it. That's very, very scary, Larry. Um, especially coming out of your mouth because you know what this, how this happens in other places. Uh, in my last question, we've been talking about the national stage. I, I wanted you just to reflect a little bit on our local conditions here. Uh, the crisis sparked by George Floyd's killing has not, tr not only triggered national wide protests, but also seems to be getting uh, Alice, let, let's cut that out and we'll come back to it, okay? We can do that. Let me just read this question. Um, we'll, we'll clean it up later, Larry. Uh, the crisis sparked by George Floyd's killing has not only triggered nationwide protests, but it also seems to be beginning a new era of activism and soul searching here even at Stanford University and within our own institutions. What responsibilities do we have within universities, Larry, and other institutions that you're affiliated with to address systematic problems of racial bias and injustice? Well, um, Mike, first of all, thank you for taking the initiative to organize a, conference, uh, a conversation within FSI earlier this week. I think we're all uh, going through, or if we're not, we need to go through a period of uh, serious introspection and frankly, listening to our students, uh, listening to our African American and other uh, uh, colleagues from uh, racial minorities and the great panoply a mosaic of diversity that has the potential uh, to make America great again, if I may say so, <laughs> in a different uh, way. And, um, uh, you know, we need to listen. Um, I think the fact that none of us has racial bias in our hearts uh, is not enough. Uh, that's the uh, message I think we're hearing, that institutionalized racism works in a variety of insidious ways. Right. And passivity <laughs> is, uh, you know, is a partner to it. Uh, so we need to be proactive. And I think listening to our colleagues, listening to our students and thinking, uh, in every case, what can we do? What small part can we play, first of all, to make our institutions uh, more open, inclusive, and diverse? And second of all, you know, to when we have the capacity to do so. And I, I think in some ways uh, there are streams of work at FSI that have the capacity to do so, to work on some of these issues uh, in terms of governance and policing and economic uh, justice and inclusion and equality and uh, racial bias in the response to the pandemic, which invokes important issues of, uh, public health response. Right. Uh, and we're part of a university that uh, needs to do better, wants to do better, and uh, needs to be pushed not only by uh, uh, faculty and students of, and staff of color, but by all other faculty, students, staff, and alumni to do better. That's a great point. 
Thanks for sharing that, Larry, and thanks for being here on World Class again with us. Uh, unfortunately, I think before November, we're going to have to have you back, uh, given the, the stakes that are at play with the future of American democracy. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like what you're hearing, please review us on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know your thoughts. And be sure to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you're listening to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.